Coming up next, we have a great one for you. The story of a 70s chart classic that just raked from late 76 into 1977. It's produced by legend Alan Parsons, who, of course, engineered Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Now, with this 70s classic, he showed a really different side of himself in a song that's like a, a, a song puzzle. And we're going to try to piece it together to figure out what it actually means with interviews with the singer-songwriter and the iconic producer. You know, this singer-songwriter had to rewrite this song three different times. Three different songs. Uh, lyrics can completely different subject all three times. And then one night he was up late, he was watching a, a old classic movie and it all clicked. He also had a book from his girlfriend and kind of combined it. It's a really cool story. It's coming up in the interviews next. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever heard a song on the radio for the first time, especially when you were younger and you were just blown away, you immediately went out and bought the album. I'll tell you, you're going to dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now because here you get the inside story of your favorite songs, soundtrack of your life, most of the time straight from the artist. Make sure to hit the bell so you never miss out. And you know, help support our mission of curating rock and pop history here by clicking on our Patreon link below we give you more content. Now, I've talked about it before on here, but I always love a great song that's like a puzzle, a song that you have to really listen to carefully, like decoding it. Al Stewart's classic 1976 song, You're the Cat, is definitely one of those compositions. In the air of the cat. It was released in 76, peaked at number five on the Billboard Hot 100 into 77, also went to the top 10 in Australia. The film Casablanca was a major inspiration for the song, which of course name checks actors Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre. And in fact, it's the biggest hit about Casablanca in history, even more successful than Casablanca's own popular standard as time goes by. You must remember this. It was interesting how a lot of pop artists at that time were inspired by old movie stars like Humphrey Bogart. You know, Rupert Holmes was very close to using that actor as the main part of the lyric to escape the Pina Colada song. If you like Pina Coladas, get caught. It was going to be If You Like Humphrey Bogart, change it to If You Like Pina Coladas instead. And then, of course, Bertie Higgins name checked Bogey in his 1981 yacht rock classic. Key Largo. Just like the call. I'm sure if I dug even deeper into my mind, I could think of another one or two. But it took a while for Al to get this song down. So he toured with this band called the Sutherland Brothers, and their keyboardist was a guy named Peter Wood. So Peter played this really haunting piano part at Soundcheck all the time. After hearing it about 14 or 15 times, Al Stewart approached him and told him, this is a wonderful song. I'd like to try and put lyrics to it. Peter said, go ahead. So Al did it. He said writing the lyrics, though, was a huge challenge. First, he came up with a set of lyrics about an English comedian named Tony Hancock. The song was called Foot of the Stage. This comedian had committed suicide in Australia, and Al Stewart saw him right before. And uh, he could tell something was horribly wrong. So he wrote the chorus, your tears fell down like rain at the foot of the stage. Very poetic. The American record company, though, told Al that they'd never heard of Tony Hancock. So Al said, and I quote, well, that's annoying, so I'll take the piss out of him. So I wrote a song about Princess Anne called Horse of the Year. The lyrics were, Prince Anne rode off on the horse of the year. But the label they didn't like that one either. At this point, Al was beginning to lose his mind because he had this piece of music like forever. He just couldn't think of any words. He knew it was going to be a good song, so he kept at it. Al would later say that he had a girlfriend at the time and she had a book on Vietnamese astrology, which was kind of obscure, and it was open at a chapter that was called The Year of the Cat, which is actually the year of the rabbit in Chinese astrology. But uh, he liked the title, The Year of the Cat, but he'd joke around, you know, later saying, if it was The Year of the Cat, it might go something like this. I used to have a ginger tabby, and now I have a ginger tom. The first one made me crabby, the new one. He thought, you can't write about cats. It's ridiculous. 
And uh, he said, I was absolutely lost. And then Casablanca came on television and I thought, you know what, I'll grab Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre and to see where it goes. Now that's half the story. Coming up next, Al is gonna tell you the important part, along with the legend, Alan Parsons. This is a really cool interview. Now for a little background, Scottish singer, songwriter, and folk rocker Al Stewart, he came to the music scene as part of the British folk revival in the 60s and 70s. He had a very interesting style of mixing, you know, folk rock songs with masterfully woven tells of, you know, unique characters and events in history. Very much a poet. He actually played at the first ever Glastonbury uh, Festival that happened in 1970. He lived in a flat for a time with a young Paul Simon. He even knew Yoko Ono before she even met John Lennon. He's worked with everybody from Jimmy Page to Richard Thompson. And when he started creating the landmark album Year of the Cat, he had genius producer, engineer, artist Alan Parsons at the helm. And uh, Al Stewart actually had the music and orchestration written and completely recorded before he even had a title for any of the songs. So anyway, he'll tell you more about this elegant pop masterpiece, Year of the Cat. One of the greats of all time. I'm really excited about this one. The year of the cat. This story of this song, it'll have you exploring the song and the album in depth once you see it, because it's just got a, such a cool and mysterious aura. Now this video, Sponsored by Zenni Eyewear, my favorite specs. If you need a new pair of glasses or sunglasses, whether prescription or no prescription, you're gonna love the variety and really the excellence of Zenni. So affordable in today's economy, uh, you'll get one for what you spend on a vinyl record. Click on the info button right up here to get it. Here's Al Stewart and Alan Parsons with the story of You're the Cat. Well, you were born in Glasgow, but yep. uh, you grew up in England. But Wimborne is just not to the north of Bournemouth. And uh, we had, oh, uh, uh, Rob Fripp, uh, Robert Fripp uh, from King Crimson lived just up the road from me. We could be heroes. And I took guitar lessons from him for a while. And Greg Lake from Emerson Lake and Palmer lived just down in the other way. So there were a bunch of us, you know, who were, uh, you know, aspiring musicians. Of course, shared a flat with Paul Simon. Tell me a little bit about that time. I mean, I wanted to, I didn't want to be a folk musician at all. I mean, I, when I was 17, I just wanted to join, you know, I wanted to be a Beatle. Everybody yeah. did. Uh, but it percolating away in the back of my mind, uh, I'd been listening to this American called Bob Dylan, who nobody in Bournemouth had ever heard of. I mean, I think I was the first person with one of the records. How many roads must a man walk down? When I went up to London in 1965, I was looking to join a band, but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, uh, you know, maybe this folk thing, I mean, maybe something could happen with it. And I auditioned for four bands. So I didn't, I, I got accepted by two, two bands that I didn't want to join. And I got turned down by the two that I, you know, <laughs> yeah. I would have joined. Um, so um, I, w I went down to a coffee bar in the West End of London and, and uh, the owner said, are you a folk singer? We need a folk singer. And I just said, yes. I didn't know anything about it, but I knew by that time maybe 20 Bob Dylan songs. And um, I, I sold my electric guitar, bought an acoustic guitar, and I went down and I sang a whole evening of Bob Dylan songs. And his only comment was, you sure sing a lot of Bob Dylan songs. <laughs> and then in, in quick succession, three things happened that completely changed my life. I mean, well, first of all, I was getting the gig at Bunches. Uh, a couple of months later, I, I needed a place to stay. And um, I went to this place in the East End. and. Uh, one day through the door comes Paul Simon and, and uh, he moved into the room next door to me and I could hear him writing songs through the wall, you know. Uh, Sitting in the railway station, got a ticket for my mm, procrastination. Uh, destination. <laughs> and I thought, that's how you do it. Railway station, got a ticket for my destination. About three months, you know, of listening to Paul through the wall, I, I got an idea of, you know, how to do it. And I learned all his songs as well. So you've got bang, 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 bang. I say I'm a folk singer, I'm not. I meet Paul Simon, I listen to Bob Dylan. I go and see Bob Dylan and I see Bert Chance. And um, I would say within eight months of moving to London, I'd given up all thoughts of joining a band and I'd basically become what I said I was, which I wasn't, which is, uh, you know, a singer-songwriter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about meeting Alan and about working at Abbey Road and how that came together. Yeah, um, Alan's a big one for having um, dinners and, and uh, and, you know, nice wine, fine dining, you know what I mean? He's not a hamburger person, you know. I said, look, I'm supposed to do a new album, you know, would, would you like to produce it? He said, sure. And then we went straight back to the conversation we were having before. It was that quick. 
because we didn't really want to talk about that. We wanted to talk about Chateau Palmer 1961. When you started to work with him, Year of the Cat, 76 comes out. And the air of the cat. You had written all the orchestrations and written and recorded before you called the, the song titles anything. Well, before I wrote any lyrics, I recorded all the music. I'm, my job, I'm a lyric writer. So I'm not a musician, you know, I mean, I, I really, I'm not. Um, but if I, if I were the lead guitar player of a, of a blues band, what, what we would do is um, we'd go in and we'd record a backing track to a blues song. And then you send the guitar player out and he does maybe 12 different takes. And he's looking for the perfect solo. Plays it over and over again. And eventually the producer says, oh, that's it, that's the one. My technique is exactly the same thing. I recorded all the music, took it home, and I would wake up in the morning and I would write, you know, four different sets of lyrics for it. That's what I read, that you and, wrote uh, four different sets. Yeah, That's and if incredible. it had four verses, I'd write 12 or 16, and, and uh, then, you know, pick the ones I, the, that I thought were appropriate. So it's, it's like the art of improvisation for a guitar player becomes the art of improvisation for a, a lyric writer. It's exactly the same thing. She comes in the album cover was always so distinct, and of course, uh, Storm did that album cover. Yeah. What was the idea behind the album cover? When you work with, with Storm, uh, what you do is you go in and you give him the record, and uh, when he's ready, he gives you the cover, and that's the cover. You don't have any say in it. Really? <laughs> that's interesting. He didn't, never asked my opinion. He just yeah. said, here's your album cover. Year of the Cat started out as a different song. It was about Tony Hancock. Have you tried the theater workshop? I'm an actor, sir, not a carpenter. <laughs> A British comedian. Yeah, you know, I had I, not just that. It was called Horse of the Year for a while. Princess and rode off on the horse of the year. Da 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 da. Um, and, it, and the Tony Hancock one was at the foot of the stage. I routine. saw him a stand-up routine, and I knew there was something terribly wrong. He kept saying, um, "I don't want to be here. I hate my life." You know, because he played this character. You know, yeah. his very rundown character, and the whole audience were laughing apart from me because I thought this man means this. And sure enough, he committed suicide about uh, two or three months after that. So I'm looking at him, and I wrote this line: "His tears fell down like rain at the foot of the stage," which is, you know becomes the lyric of uh, what then became "Year of the Cat." The year of the cat. Uh, because I, I could see, you know, he this man, you know, he no, he's serious, and everyone was laughing. You know. Just one of those odd moments, you know. And then, of course, the record label, always read that the record label didn't yeah. want you because Tony, or the, the song to be called that because Americans didn't know who Tony no, Hancock was. No, Americans didn't know who Tony Hancock was, yeah. so I, I changed it. And I had a girlfriend with a book called, um, it was Vietnamese Astrology. It was open at a, a chapter called The Year of the Cat. And I don't know much, you know, like, I mean, I really don't know much. <laughs> Uh, but one thing I can do is I can spot a title of a song. You know? yeah. <laughs> what a great title. And yeah. 1975 being when you wrote it was, was the Year of the it Cat. It was the Year, the year of the, of the Rabbit, yeah. which is also yeah. Year of the Cat. Exactly, yeah. The cat. Updated North African love song is what well, you said. Well, yeah, that's right, because it's set in North Africa. Um, you know, it, it just comes on from the whole um, uh, Humphrey Bogart thing. You know. On a morning from a Bogart you were watching TV, right? Yeah. And Casablanca came Casablanca on. Casablanca comes on, and I think, well, I'll put that in the song too. You know. The crowd like Peter Lorre contemplating a crime. Yeah. I didn't really know where to go with it because Year of the Cat. I'm not going to write about Vietnamese astrology. You can't write the song about a cat either, about a no. bunch of cats. And <laughs> you're kind of joking around about different lyrics about felines and different things like that. I thought that was interesting. Probably. But I mean, I, I just, I'm, you know, I don't know. I mean, you write all this stuff down. <laughs> you wake up the next morning, it's all rubbish. Oh, God, what was I thinking? You know, One of the great first lines to get to, I mean, because it's not your typical verse, chorus, verse, chorus song. And the thing that always caught me was a, like a watercolor in the rain. I, I just you said, going to say that? Dress running like a watercolor in the rain. One of my favorite songs. I mean, yeah, I'm, I just love that song. And and it's kind of interesting because I don't know if you've ever heard of the term yacht rock, where they're yacht rock, yeah, <laughs> hollow notes. And the Doobie Brothers. And Al Stewart is kind of thrown into that, the kind of the '70s soft rock thing. Tell me about producing that album because Al was really more of a kind of folk 
had a folk thing and you took him more to the jazz side with some of those records. Tell me about that. I mean, it was only, I mean, I wouldn't say it was jazz. It was just, we, for the first time, put a saxophone on one of his songs. Phil Kenzie on the sax. He was watching a movie. He didn't want to come down to the, yeah, that's the right. session. Tell me about that. That's it's funny. true. We did. We done everything. Um, we'd reached a point where Alan wanted to put a, a sax on on the record, which I really didn't want. I mean, it wasn't. It's not a folk rock instrument. I mean, you know, I like the jangle stuff. You know, you know the birds. Hey, Bob Dylan. The times they are changing. Simon and Garfunkel. Just a poor boy, though my story is seldom told. I squad. He just sort of scratched his head and said, Saxophone? I'm a folk, you know, I'm a, meant to be a soft rock, soft, soft rock folk artist, not, not, a, not a jazzer, you know. You know, it's saxophone, what's that? You want a jazz record? I mean. <laughs> so he was a little, a little surprised at the suggestion, but he, he allowed me to go through with it. And I called in Phil Kenzie, who was a, an old friend that I'd worked with uh, on a number of uh, my own records, other people's records. Called up Phil Kenzie and Kenzie didn't want to come. He'd only lived around the corner. He said, look, he said, I'm halfway through a movie. Um, he said, if I can do it in, in one or two takes and, and see the end of the movie, I'll do it. But if it takes any longer than that, I'm just going to go home. Plays in two takes, goes home and sees the rest of the movie. And that was that. And I said, I don't like this. It sounds like a wounded cow. Alan said, well, live with it and come back tomorrow and see what you think. So I slept on it and I came back the next day and I still, yeah, it just doesn't sound like folk rock to me, but it had some sort of eerie, you know, there was an eeriness to it. Mysterious. As, as if it was coming out of a mist. It's like I'm standing like in, next to a mountain range like here. And, and then this comes rolling down rather like a, a sort of a small avalanche tearing out, out, of the, out, out of maybe the sunrise or something. And, um, okay, all right, fine, yeah. leave it on the record. <laughs> and uh, to cut a long story short, Phil Kenzie joined Al's band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, for the next, uh, for the next album, and uh, he was all over the next album, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Time passages. <laughs> well, of course, what's so distinct also about the record is the second that you hear the piano part. Peter Wood. Be just kind of playing that, and you when you yeah. Were... Well, we did a tour um, opening for Linda Ronstadt. Nineteen seventy-five. It was my first American tour, and Peter played this at Soundcheck every night. So I heard it every night. Eventually, I, I said, "Look, let me write some lyrics to that." And um, he wasn't very pleased, but he said, "Okay, if you must." Yeah. <laughs> And um, I, don't, I don't know what he thought about it, but I said, well, you know, let's record it. I mean, just for fun. But I, I didn't, it was different from what I normally did. So in order to hide it, I put it as the last track on the record because I figured, uh, you know, by the time people got there, they would, I, they'd know if they liked the record or not. So if they heard this and they didn't like it, it wouldn't stop them from uh, liking it. They, they could just take the needle off before they, before they got to that track. You know? <laughs> It's been covered so many times, but the interesting was a guy named Hector with Finnish lyrics. FR David covered it as well. The movies uh, that's been used in, you know, Running With Scissors, HBO used it with a show called Hello Ladies. I, I had a song in The, in, um, the Sopranos and um, a bit of time passes just actually, and my manager called me up and said, we've got a check from the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. What are your memories of Al Stewart and A Year of the Cat? What do you think about Alan Parsons, his, his production technique? What are your memories of this? A lot of people call this a Yacht Rock song. Not sure about that. Definitely a soft rock classic from the 70s. Uh, what are your memories of it? What do you think the song means? Let us know below in the comments. Uh, if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our daily history of music. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.